up on this episode of Terp Vision, teeing up students for the fast-paced world of sports journalism. A new college prep school built by Maryland designed for the next generation of students. A decades-long research study on a bird species in Australia that offers clues about evolution. Our football team riding a wrong that's lingered for 76 years, and the faculty member using video projection to address the painful world of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's all coming up next on Terp Vision. Welcome back to Terp Vision. I'm Bonnie Bernstein. We're talking today about the people, places, and programs that make the University of Maryland one of the world's great universities. We are here in Knight Hall, home to the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. To no one's surprise, for someone like me, sports is one of the fastest growing markets for aspiring journalists. And that is precisely why two years ago, Maryland created the Shirley Povich Center for Sports Journalism here at the J School. It's not only giving students the chance to get some incredibly valuable hands-on experience, but they're also learning from some of the top figures in the industry today. Does the addition of the teams from the East in the Big Ten take away from the tradition of the Big Ten being a Midwestern conference? It's another packed house. Since its inception, the Shirley Povich Center for Sports Journalism has brought together some of the top figures from the sports media world who shape this dynamic field. Shirley Povich was a groundbreaking sports journalist at the Washington Post for 75 years. He produced columns of great meaning and substance. He was a staunch proponent of racial and gender equality. In 2011, his children, Maury, Lynn, and David, helped establish a sports journalism center under the direction of longtime sports Would editor like George introduce. Solomon. We all felt that it was something, uh, you know, to establish in his memory a way to show students and faculty alike how to do journalism, how to do it right, how to do it ethically, how to do it well. The Povich Center taps the rich legacy of Terps who've established a foothold in the sports industry, bringing them back to campus for panel discussions, symposia, and other events, including workshops for high school students. Solomon also teaches sports classes in Knight Hall along with his colleague, Kevin Blackestone. A visiting professor, Blackstone's a working journalist known for his columns and appearances on ESPN. He talks to his classes not just about Povich's exemplary record as a journalist, but also his use of sports as a jumping off platform for discussing pressing social issues. He had standards, he was fearless, he had ethics, he had a moral compass, and I think all of that is really important. So for a journalism school to tie its name to a sports center that is dedicated in Shirley Povich's name and his memory, I think really, really speaks highly for the journalism that the college is producing. Interest in sports journalism at the Merrill College continues to grow, with both the college and Povich Center providing real-world focus. Students cover on-campus events as well as local pro teams, and alum like ESPN Scott Van Pelt and WJLA7 Washington Sports Director Tim Branch return to their roots to inspire, mentor, and share their experiences. Find your voice, say what you think, be authentic. It's a great time to be in this business because it's easier than ever to share your thoughts. It's also the most difficult because anyone can. And so there's more clutter and there's more noise and how do you cut through? And you cut through by being authentic. Be able to communicate at a very high level of intellect so that you have that personal relationship with whoever it is that you're dealing with. And the same I think when you're dealing with a story. You know, you have to look at it with, from the human side, from the technical side, and from what's taking place in that story. The legacy of Shirley Povich lives daily in Knight Hall and through events like the Lacey Smith Award. 
ESPN's Claire Smith was recently named the first honoree for her more than 30-year career that shattered both racial and gender barriers, a career that certainly would have made Shirley Povich proud. Povich, over the course of his career, fought for justice and fought for equality in sports, which is what the Povich Center strives for as well. University President Wallace Lowe has made it a priority to improve the area surrounding campus, new retail development, improved transportation, expanded safety measures. This fall, another piece of his efforts being realized, a new college prep school designed specifically for the coming wave of students. They've got their own moniker, Digital Natives. Sixth grader David Hay is just one of a handful of students at his middle school who wants to learn Mandarin. Now, at many traditional schools, he might not have that option, but he can at the College Park Academy, a new rigorous college prep school offering a blended learning curriculum. And not only can David take Mandarin, he could also take Italian, German, or even sign language with an online instructor. Ni hao is hello. Ni jiao shi is what is your name. And goodbye is tsai chin. This fall, the academy opened just around the corner from the university with 300 sixth and seventh graders. College Park Academy is innovative for two reasons. First, we are the second early college, middle school and high school in the state of Maryland. Second, we are a bricks and click school. We use a blended learning model, which means that all of our curriculum is online and every student has a laptop and they use that laptop and their curriculum both with on-site teachers as well as online teachers. Students take classes like language arts, math, and science in traditional classrooms where a teacher answers questions and leads mini lessons as students work through their units online. For electives, students work in a big team room and they have a wide variety of options, including seven language courses and a music exploration program designed by the world-renowned Juilliard School. My favorite thing is that we can go at our own pace. In my elementary school, they would go a little too fast for me and a little too slow. So like, I wouldn't be able to get all of the notes like I am here. The Academy is a partnership between the University of Maryland, the City of College Park, and PG County Public Schools. It's all part of University President Wallace Lowe's vision of making College Park a top 20 college town by 2020. To achieve that, Lowe's encouraging faculty and staff to live near the university, and providing top-notch middle and high school programs in the area is an important step in achieving that dream. The Academy currently draws students from 107 different elementary schools throughout the county, 15% of whom come from independent, religious, or home schools. Each year, a new class will be added until the school features 6th through 12th grade. The best students for College Park Academy are those that are independent, that are self-motivated, and that really have a goal in mind. Should students complete the curriculum quickly, they'll have the opportunity to earn up to 60 college credits, including 25 from the University of Maryland. It's just one of the many ways the academy and the university are linked. Faculty members, for example, will research the efficacy of different blended learning curricula. Maryland students also play a big role. We have a number of interns that have started working with us. Not only are they helping with classroom instruction, but they're also um, leading clubs such as soccer, cheerleading, and our robotics program. Once a week, six College Park scholars teach students how to program robots to perform tasks like scooping up objects or spinning in circles. It's kind of a great teaching block for a lot of kids, especially earlier on, to get them motivated, interested in certain types of engineering. It has a lot of great applications, especially helping kids with their critical thinking skills. We intend to get the entire campus involved in working with the schools. Uh, there are so many opportunities for us to work with the students at College Park Academy and get them used to the campus and get them where they feel very comfortable with the campus and think, oh my, College Park might be a great place for me to go to college someday. At least one Academy student has already made his choice. I have already decided this, that I'm going to Maryland. 
Satin bowerbirds have long fascinated naturalists, including Charles Darwin himself. Their unique courtship behavior has been the subject of a decades-long research study right here in Maryland, and it's given students the chance to live and work abroad in the beautiful rainforests of Australia. There is a place tucked away in a small tract of rainforest in southeastern Australia called Wallaby Creek. Set aside as a nature reserve and now a national park, Wallaby Creek is home to a fascinating array of life, including snakes, giant monitor lizards, kangaroos, wallabies, and more than 300 species of birds. But it is one particular species that's been the subject of a decades-long research project by a University of Maryland evolutionary biologist named Gerald Borgia, a winged wonder called the satin bowerbird. Bowerbirds generally build bowers. Different species build different shapes of bowers. Satin bowerbirds build relatively small bowers, but they build very neat bowers. Then they go around and collect blue and put it on their bower. Once these elaborate structures are complete, females flock to the bowers to size up their strength, dissect the decorations, and choose their mate. This is by no stretch of the imagination an easy courtship. The male dances, flicks his wings, showcases his creativity skills, and even mimics other bird species like cockatoos and kookaburras. And the males are not above raiding the competition, stealing decorations, and even destroying other males' bowers. This is a way of kind of competing because what the females do is they come into an area and they search around bowers and they're comparing males in a particular area. So if you can kind of reduce the quality of the bowers of other males, then that improves your chances of the females wanting to mate with you. What's unique about bowerbirds is that they mate almost exclusively in bowers. This presents a rare opportunity for Borgia and his team of researchers. We could put cameras on each individual bower and monitor it and at the end of the season, we could have a complete record of everything that those birds did. This is unparalleled in any kind of research. Cameras set up at each bower are equipped with infrared sensors. So when the bird arrives, the sensor is triggered and the recording begins. A team of Maryland grad students and field assistants hike out into the rainforest twice a day to change the videotapes and check on the unique power supply. The cameras are powered by car batteries, so the assistants have the wonderful task of carrying car batteries up steep hills in the mud to the very distant bowers. As if hauling heavy car batteries through the rainforest isn't taxing enough, field assistants don't exactly have the coziest of abodes. The living conditions at Wallaby Creek were a little rough. We take baths in the creek. It's pretty rustic. There were snakes living in the house sometimes. Some people just enjoyed it and loved it, and other people found it a little too much. Still, field assistants who can endure the hardships find themselves in the truly wonderful environment of Wallaby Creek. It's just an amazing place with a lot of different life going on, and you just see amazing things in there. I mean, you're walking down the trail, you see a koala, you see a giant python eating a wallaby. Every day you go out, you see something new. Ultimately, though, it comes back to the research. Borgia's extended study is crucial because of the bird's long lifespan to truly understand reproductive life following year after year is a must. The hypothesis that we're testing is that the part of genetic variation that's most important is to remove deleterious alleles that happen in the genome. What we want to do is sequence the genome of bowerbirds and then look for what are called SNPs. These are deleterious mutations and see if what we think is correct, that the males who are at the top of the lek, who the females like the best, are the ones with the fewest deleterious mutations. Are these deleterious mutations important for mate choice in bowerbirds? Well, that extends to every other species. In other words, every species has deleterious mutations happening in it. It is a real general question and one that actually needs to be answered. It's never too late to right a wrong. 
rewind to Maryland football way back in 1937 when segregation in the South was still very much alive. That season, the Terrapins refused to face Syracuse here in Maryland unless the Orangemen benched their top player, and they did. 76 years later, Maryland has finally made amends. In January 2012, Kumea Shorter Gooden assumed the position of Chief Diversity Officer at her alma mater, the University of Maryland. Just a year into her tenure, she heard an amazing story. I actually was hosting a Christmas party last winter uh, and had cousins and family and friends and colleagues over. And my cousin Lynn, I started talking with him and said, well, you, you know, obviously I'm back at Maryland. And he said, you know, that, that's great, Kumea, but do you know about Wilmoth? Kumea's cousin showed her a 2008 story in the Washington City paper about another member of their family, Wilmoth Sadat Singh. Wilmoth Sadat Singh grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, born in 1918. His father died when he was about seven. Uh, Wilmoth is African American, and his mother remarried someone who was South Asian Indian, thus the last name Sadat Singh. Wilmoth was a star athlete, finally started playing football at Syracuse in the mid-30s. Syracuse was about to play Maryland, here in Maryland, in 1937. The D.C. press ran a story where a reporter said that Wilmoth is black, and isn't that interesting that he's going to be playing the University of Maryland that doesn't accept black students? The University of Maryland said, oh no, and told Syracuse that if Wilmoth is fielded, no game. Syracuse benched Wilmoth. Such a decision seems unimaginable now, but the 1930s were a different time. This was a southern state, and in the 30s we were still living with Jim Crow and segregation, and black students were not allowed to attend the University of Maryland. The first black students at University of Maryland were in 1951, and so that was the context. The last sentence of the City Paper article resonated with Kumea. It read, and the family has yet to hear from the University of Maryland. And so Kumea reached out to Maryland Athletics Director Kevin Anderson. It just so happened Syracuse was on the football schedule as a new member of the ACC. Finally, an injustice from so long ago would be righted. In November 2013, Wilmoth's family gathered at the game, and between the first and second quarters, Anderson and Daryl Hill, Maryland's first African-American football player, presented the Wilmoth family with a wounded warrior jersey to a rousing ovation from the crowd. It was a very festive atmosphere and a real sense that uh, it's never too late to correct an injustice. The tribute of the special jersey was particularly fitting because Wilmoth had served in what's become known as the Tuskegee Airmen, where he died in a training accident in Michigan at just 25 years old. For Kumea and Wilmoth's family, the day carried strong emotional meaning. I think this is really important, not just for Wilmoth's family, but also for the broader community of African-Americans, people who grew up during the time of Jim Crow, this honoring of Wilmoth is important because his struggle and the injustices that he faced, while more public and obvious and egregious perhaps than those that others may have faced, it's really emblematic of the racism that uh, blacks in the community experienced for many decades. Today, the University of Maryland is a leader in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. A lot has changed. Over the decades, Maryland has done a lot to become an institution quite different from the one that Wilmoth encountered. We have a very diverse student population. 35% of our undergraduates are students of color. We have a faculty and staff that are diverse. We provide an opportunity for students from all groups, regardless of their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their ability, their socioeconomic status, their religion to engage with others, to learn from others, so that they are really prepared to leave the campus and to serve a diverse, dynamic world. 
Jared Mazzacci already has students clamoring to attend his class in projection design. It's no wonder. Maryland's one of the few schools in the country to offer a class in this new art form. Jared's work recently became even more important when he collaborated with other artists and veteran organizations to help raise awareness of post-traumatic stress disorder. Music, theater, and dance can inspire creativity, express emotion, and tell a story. But they also have the ability to impact social change. Jared Mazzacci, a visiting professor of multimedia in Maryland School of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, recently collaborated with other artists on You Are Dead, You Are Here, a play which helped raise awareness about the psychological impact of combat. You Are Dead, You Are Here is a story of uh, Michael, a returning veteran, uh, going to an experimental kind of new form of therapy with the use of virtual Iraq, which is a virtual reality goggles, and you walk through simulated versions of Iraq or Afghanistan, and it allows the patient to talk through their anxieties, and usually their anxieties are about the nothingness that's happening and the fear that something will happen. As is usually the case, art imitates life. Virtual Iraq, which Mazzacci used to design the projection design for the play, was actually created in 2004 by Skip Rizzo, a clinical psychologist doing immersion therapy on patients suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. At Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, Dr. Michael Roy, a retired Army colonel, is leading research using Virtual Iraq to treat both active and retired service members. This treatment really makes a difference. And it's also, I think, more appealing than other treatments for many service members. This is something that will bring them in where they might be resistant to traditional talk therapy or just taking another medicine. The actors in You Are Dead, You Are Here simulate the powers of virtual reality therapy on stage. But program director Lee Wilson Smiley believes the real healing takes place in the audience. It's in the theater in, with other people where we encounter the deepest parts of our humanity. Performing arts has always been involved with changing society and social change. It's the place where we talk about cultural difference, cultural acceptance, the place where we can all come together again, um, where we acknowledge and don't hide pain, and where there can be real healing. The show, which ran off Broadway in New York, also included pre-performance talks with veterans organizations with the goal of raising awareness of PTSD and treatment options. What was most exciting about after every show was how many people lingered in the space and were conversing not necessarily about the show but about the issue. Somebody watching the play can see the the vulnerability that the patient feels, how difficult that is to bear your soul. Talk about these very painful memories with a therapist, but how much they can be helped by doing so. Back in the classroom, Mazzacci uses his real world experience to educate and inspire. Yes, okay. I would hope that all projection design programs have faculty that are working for students to watch that I'm succeeding and failing at the same pace that they are just on a stage somewhere else, I think allows for conversation to take place of saying, okay, if you were in my shoes or if I were in your shoes, how could we do this? And it's more of a team effort. Many of them have gone and worked with Jared in Europe and in New York and regionally here in the area. And it gives our students possibilities that are way beyond what they could have done before. Well, that puts a wrap on this latest edition of Turp Vision. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I'm Bonnie Bernstein. Fear the turtle.